Good evening and welcome to this Polyproduce webinar. Thank you very much for taking the time to log on. Uh, I'm very excited about the, the attendance for tonight's presentations. It seems like we have a good turnout um, and uh, looking forward to, to present for the next hour. Um, this has been funded by the Scottish Government's Farm Advisory Service. We aim to cover the fundamentals of polyproduce production, uh, particularly in a croft and small holding environment uh, and setting, detailing topics from soil to sale. Um, the webinar, webinar coverage this evening will look to approximately last about one hour. Um, given the, the high number of participants tonight, uh, we'll proceed through the presentations uninterrupted. Uh, usually we would allow time at the end for vocal queries um, to be directed to the speakers. However, on this occasion, we feel that it might be too many voices to, to try and speak at any one time. So what we're aiming to do is go through the presentations. Questions can be directed to us by the chat box uh, that is available in your taskbar. Uh, and we will endeavour to answer as many of these, these questions as we can throughout the hour. Um, if we don't manage to answer questions, however, we, we will be following up after the webinar uh, and we can answer queries uh, via email and a, a follow-up. But all questions that are presented to us through the chat box uh, will be recorded and we can refer back to you at a later time. Um, I'll now be handing you over to Audrey, who will be our first speaker of the uh, of the evening. She will be looking to talk about the first stage of the polyproduce journey, covering soils and cropping. Okay, hey, good evening, all. Um, okay, tonight I'm going to be talking about crop nutrition. It's quite a short introduction. I normally I, I can I can speak on this subject for many hours, but rather tonight it's going to be shorter. So. What is soil? Well, before I start talking about crop nutrition, I've got to think about some of the other aspects of soils that have a, a big impact on, on, on crop nutrition. I want to think about soil not just as a place where the plants get their nutrients, but also a place where plants get other things. So soil is a, a very complex mixture of inorganic matter, in other words, sand, silt, clay particles, rocks and stones, and a few other things sometimes they get in there and not meant to be there, such as bits of plastic, but that's all the, all the inorganic matter and then organic matter in various stages of decomposition. So from the very, very fresh stuff like dung that's just come out the back of an animal or plant residue, leaves and, and stems and so on, right down to the very, very tiny black, well decomposed fractions or humified organic matter, all of that's organic matter and then water and then air, obviously, both absolutely essential for life of plants and animals. And then the living organisms, which, strictly speaking, that's part of organic matter as well, but you, we usually don't count that other than the very, very small microorganisms. So what does soil actually provide to crops? Well, it provides support, in other words, somewhere for the roots to get anchorage. Um, it provides water, nutrients, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. And air, and air is important not just for the plant roots themselves, but it's also important for the other organisms that are living in the soil. So the tiny ones like fungi and bacteria and protozoans and so on, but also the larger things like earthworms and moles, for example. Um, air is important for all of those, as well as for the plant roots that are growing down there. Now, some plants actually don't need too much in the way of air. Things like flag iris, for example, which are very adapted to growing in in wet boggy conditions or alder is another one in the tree, the tree alder. But most crop plants need a good amount of air around about their roots. They also need space for roots to grow. So there must be space in the soil for roots to grow. Otherwise, roots can't function properly. And if they cannot function properly in terms of exploring the soil, then they can't take up nutrients properly either. Soil also provides surfaces, a medium for interaction um, between all the organisms that live there, the plants and the animals that live there. And also warmth. There's not a lot of that at the moment. But then there's not a lot of growth either at the moment. Our soils are sitting outside there with a temperature of about one or two degrees um, on the surface. Nothing much is happening. Warmth is required in order for, for plants to grow. Back now to soil fertility, because Plants can't actually function properly unless all those other things are there. The soils can't provide enough nutrients for the plants that are growing in them unless soil structure is right and uh, soil texture is right. 
So I haven't said anything about that here because we simply don't have time. But normally before I even begin to talk about soil fertility, I first of all have to talk about the importance of soil structure and the effect which texture, in other words, the proportions of sand, silt and clay can have on um, the way in which a soil behaves and the way in which it, it can provide nutrients to plants. No time for that tonight, possibly time for questions in the future. But what is soil fertility? Well, soil fertility is the ability of soils to supply nutrients to the crops or the, or the, the, the wild plants that are growing in it. And inherent soil fertility depends on the, the mixture of minerals in the weathered rock material that the soils derive from and also the elemental composition of those minerals. So some soils are naturally much more fertile than others. So this, some of the basalt soils that you get in the sky, for example, very naturally very fertile soils. And some of the very poor, nutrient poor soils that you get over quartz and granite, um, they're not very fertile soils. Um, but the actual fertility of a soil, one of your soils, depends on the above to an extent, but probably much more on what you've done to the soil in terms of managing it, um, what you've grown on it, and what you've added over the years in terms of lime to bring the pH up to what you want it to be, and also bagged fertilizers if you use them, or bulky fertilizers like um, manures, animal manures and composts, for example. So how do you actually maintain soil fertility? Well, natural weathering and release of elements is so much slower than that which would be required to satisfy crop needs. You have to add stuff, in other words. So maintenance of fertility and supply of nutrients to crops depends on natural nutrient deposition. So there's some of that happening, but actually probably a lot less. I've got N and S there, that's nitrogen and sulfur. Um, you do get some natural nitrogen deposition, but not enough for your crops to yield the kind of yields you'd want. We used to get a lot more sulphur deposited because of industry, basically, polluted air, if you like, but we get far less now and virtually every farmer um, has to add sulphur if he wants to get um, quality yields, uh, good yields of quality crops. Some of the nutrients you get, um, you need for your crops could be returned from the previous crop. Some crops like brassicas, for example, leave a lot of nitrogen in the soil, a lot of nutrients in the soil. But you probably have to add something else in the way of dumps, compost, bagged fertilizers, even if you want to put those on. Um, and the other thing is the availability of nutrients to, to plants depends very much on, as I've said earlier, other things rather than just the nutrients. So soil pH is very important. Cation exchange capacity, that means the amount of charged surfaces in the soil which can take and hold positively and negatively charged nutrient ions. Soil structure is very important. In other words, the lack of compaction, you should, you should have soils which have plenty of vertical, vertical drainage channels and spaces for air and water to be in and for the soil to drain in wet conditions. So I want to spend a bit of time looking at soil pH pH is a measure of acidity and alkalinity. It's absolutely crucial that, that your soils are at an appropriate pH for what you're trying to grow. It affects plant growth indirectly because it very much influences the availability and presence of both nutrients, nutrient ions, and also toxic ions in the soil. An ion is just basically a charged particle. Um, so something like, for example, um, the the uh, potassium ion is positively charged and it's held on negatively charged surfaces. The pH scale runs from 0 to 14 and it's a logarithmic scale. That means it's a bit like the, the scale that we use to describe earthquakes. And that means basically that a soil pH of five, for example, is actually 10 times more acid than a soil of pH six, in the same way that an, earth, an earthquake of magnitude seven on the Richter scale would actually be 10 times more than one of a magnitude of six. So it's exactly the same sort of thing. So um, it's, and that's what logarithmic means, basically. You're aiming in soils for a pH of normally about 6.5. 
So not neutral. Neutral is actually seven. Most soils in Scotland are naturally acidic. Not all, um, but but most soils are naturally acidic. So a lot of the the soils on the west coast, the macro soils, if you like, which are based on shell sand, they're often quite high peat, usually above seven. But many of the the soils based on peat and uh, acidic rocks like granite and gneiss, those are those are normally quite acid. If your soil's too acid, you have toxic ions, including aluminium and manganese particularly. They're too well dissolved at acidic pHs. They're taken up at toxic levels and you get root distortion and uh, poor root function. The other thing is the very essential nutrient phosphate or phosphorus is not well enough dissolved and you get phosphorus deficiencies. The other thing is soil organisms don't work properly. They don't mineralize nitrogen. In other words, break down nitrogen into the forms which plants can take up. They don't work very well at very acid pHs and you end up getting deficiencies, nitrogen deficiencies. And some diseases are likely to be worse as well, like club root, for example. Now, if your soils are too alkaline, that creates problems too. Again, phosphorus is not well enough dissolved that you get deficiencies. Also, you get multiple trace element deficiencies. Um, for example, that's why people can't in England where soils are often chalky, cannot grow rhododendrons and azaleas and heathers and things. They get iron deficiency. Iron is a trace element essential to plants. Um, and you get trace element deficiencies where the soils are too alkaline. So if you overline, for example, um, and some diseases are likely to be worse. So each crop has got an optimum soil pH, but of course you don't normally grow just one crop. You certainly shouldn't be growing just one crop every year in your soil. For a good healthy soil and a good healthy crop rotation, you should be aiming to have an optimum soil pH for your whole rotation. So you need to consider all the crops you're growing. And then usually what you would do is aim for about 6.5. And you could let the pH grow a, grow a little bit lower, for example, before potatoes and before oats, which, which prefer a slightly lower pH. And you would certainly never line before potatoes because you could end up getting scabby potatoes. You tend to line before brassicas, which like it a bit higher. Brassicas would be happiest about pH 6.5, but they're happy right up to pH 7 and even above. You would be ideally testing every two to four years if you're growing um, high value produce. Um, and, and certainly line at the right time, as I've said. very important to add the correct amount. Um, there's lots of cases where people, many cases on in the crofting areas where people have let their soils get too high uh, in pH because they put too much on, they haven't thought about it, haven't tested it, or they've not put on enough. So the strength of neutralizing, the neutralizing or lining value varies depending on the material that you're actually applying. And the, the size of the particles is also important. Some um, materials with finely divided particles act basically more quickly. So lime takes time to react, you need to plan ahead. And if you've got large doses of lime, um, you would ideally want to be split dressing that. In other words, you know, take a couple of years, say, so maybe five tonnes per hectare, um, which is the same as about uh, 0.5 kilograms per square metre. You would want to put that on one year, maybe again, same amount the next year. Don't put on before crops that are sensitive to lime, so not before potatoes. Usually best applied in the autumn. Let it have some time to work before cropping next year. As I've said, don't overline and don't guess soil pH. I've gone on to so many farms and crops to sort out crop problems and found they're not due to a lack of nutrients, they're due to somebody having put on far too much lime or perhaps a liming material rather than lime, something like shell sand or uh, paper crumble or some of some of the um, other materials that have got lining value. Now on to actual uh, nutrients now. Which elements are essential to plants? Well, we usually divide them into three types. Macronutrients, which are the, the elements that are required in the biggest quantities, nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. We often talk about phosphate and potash rather than phosphorus and potassium. That's convention really um, 
which it's as well to be aware of. So they're not the same thing. Phos phosphate is basically a molecule with oxygen in it, but it's still got phosphorus in it. And it's phosphorus that's the important thing as far as the plant is concerned. Then we've got secondary nutrients, which are required in smaller quantities, sulfur, calcium and magnesium. And then we've got the micronutrients. Apologies for the spelling mistake there, I've just noticed it. Then we've got the micronutrients or trace elements. I've not actually listed them all there. Some plants uh, need a few others on top of that. And then there's also, uh, so well, I've put sodium down the bottom there. Sodium can be required by some plants in quite large quantities, and it's exchangeable to some extent uh, for potassium, particularly things like beet uh, and asparagus-like sodium. So there we go. Those are the essential nutrient elements. And if you're actually applying nutrients, what do we need to be thinking about? Well, all crops need nitrogen. All crops need P and K. But when I say all crops need nitrogen, some of them actually fix their own. So if we're talking about legumes, um, that is a family of plants which naturally fix nitrogen from the soil air, I mean that by things like that, I mean clovers, lucerne, um, peas, beans, uh, vetches, bird's foot trepo, these are all, all plants which are in the legume family and they fix their own nitrogen and normally we don't need to add nitrogen to those crops, almost never in fact. Um, so the exception might be to start certain bean types of bean crop off but generally we don't think about adding nitrogen to legumes because they make their own. And not only sometimes do they make their own, they can also make enough for the next crop. If you have a, a grass clover lay in, for example, for, for a year or more, then they can fix um, significant quantities of nitrogen and enough to feed the next crop, which is actually the basis of organic farming or organic um, horticulture as well. But all crops do need nitrogen, it's just that we have to apply it to most of them, but not legumes. All crops need P and K. Calcium and magnesium are also needed, and they're usually applied in lime. Sulfur is also needed in, in some cases, particularly in large quantities for brassicas, but for, for all other crops to an extent. And trace elements. Although, if you're applying bulky organic fertilizers like composts and dungs, for example, usually there's actually enough trace elements in those. So you don't need to have to go to the worry and expense of having to actually buy trace elements, which are quite expensive. In fact, it's quite easy to overdo it with trace elements. Um, boron, you do often have to apply in sandy soil, particularly for things like root crops, carrots and sweets and turnips, but in tiny quantities. And if you overdo it, you can quickly get yourself into a, a boron toxicity problem. So you really are talking small quantities here. So how do you actually find out what you need to do? Well, soil testing. Test kits and meters are available for P and K. But frankly, I would I would always they're okay, they're cheap, they're less precise and accurate. Interpretation can be a bit difficult, deciding what to do afterwards. I would always recommend lab analysis, particularly if you're trying to produce food for money. The difference between somebody who's kind of um, well, the differences I see in crop yield and crop quality between somebody who's guessing their way along and somebody who's actually getting their lab analysis done and getting help to interpret it, it's very large. You tend to get much more reliable, higher yields of quality crops where you're doing lab analysis and having results properly interpreted. Do PK, magnesium and trace elements, that's normally all the need to bother to do. It's about £40 a sample, including an interpretation, which you might not need, but most people do, plus that and postage on top of that. Now you might have noticed that when I was talking about soil testing, I missed out a nutrient, I missed out nitrogen, which is arguably the thing that normally limits crop yield in most small-scale horty enterprises. Most people guess the amount needed and most struggle, find to ways, struggle to find ways to apply enough especially if you don't want to use bagged fertilizer. It is complicated and that's because of the because the nitrogen cycle is complicated. If you want to understand how much to apply and how to apply it, 
it's too big a topic here. There's three or four hours of chat about it on its own. So your best plan is to read the Crofting Horticulture Handbook, which is available from the Scottish Crofting Federation. It's got about this in quite some detail. So when our fertilizers actually needed for vegetable crops, well, I like to try and keep it simple. Nitrogen is needed annually by all crops, apart from legumes, the, one, the ones that fix their own, so peas and beans. You can supply nitrogen from solid, bulky organic fertilizers, so things like compost and dung, for example, bagged inorganic fertilizers, or organic liquid feeds, things like comfrey liquid, nettle tea, or bot ones like um, tomorite and phosphogen and so on. Nitrogen is the difficult one. It's the difficult one to guess, and it's too big a subject for this for this tonight's short little um, chat. P, K, and magnesium are easy. Basically, what you should do is where your soil P, K, or magnesium status are, where you test your soils and the results are low or moderate, then you need to be adding P and K. So you should aim for a target of high P and K status and moderate magnesium and you need to apply a sufficient P and K and magnesium to balance the amount you're taking off every unit with crops. So what you should do is assess your soils every two to four years, ideally every two years where high value crops are being grown but once you're up at this target status of high for P and K and moderate for magnesium according to soil analysis as done with the SAC lab then uh, you really only need to be testing your soils every, every four years probably. So to ensure good crop nutrition, you first of all always cannot ignore soil physical conditions. In other words, make sure they're as good as they can be, um, not over cultivated, but plenty of air in there and plenty of channels down which water can drain and which air can get into. So soil structure and drainage. Also plan ahead so that you're applying the right amount of lime and fertilizers at appropriate times. A good time to think about these things is actually October, November, December, when you wish it was warmer, you wish it was sunnier, and you wish you could be outside and you can't really do a lot. That is the best planning time. So to provide nutrients, know what your soil can provide. So again, have to refer you here to the Scottish Crofting, the Crofting Horticulture Handbook, which has got a lot more detail here. Find out how much each individual crop needs by looking up tables um, for the nitrogen this is, based on the crop you're growing, what you've grown in the past in your soil, and also um, your soil nutrient status, as soil analysis will tell you for P and K. And then make the best use of the nutrients that you've got available. And that, that Again, that's quite that's quite a big decision process, really. Um, what have you got available? Probably the best the best if you're using heavy things like, um, for example, dung and compost. Then the more local those resources, the better. So your own locally, uh, your own compost produced from your own garden wastes, or perhaps uh, some dung from a local farmer. Um, make use of what you've got available. Um, and I suppose most people would feel that what they want to do is use bagged fertilizers as a last resort. But I would encourage you to think about different ways of bringing in a bit more nitrogen than you're currently doing, because for most people, nitrogen is the limiting nutrient. And for many people, that means uh, making comfrey liquid feeds, for example. Or if you're working on a bigger scale, you know, half an acre or more, it probably means a bit of bagged fertilizer, whether you use um, uh, some of the organic ones like, like um, blood meal, for example, or inorganic things out of a bag. It really is a good idea to do the sums. Don't apply too much. Whenever I whenever I'm become aware of uh, when I, when I run training courses and I sit and chat with maybe 10, 14 people and I get their soils analysed and give them interpretations of, of those results and give them some help with what to do, you always find there's one or two in the middle who do everything perfectly and, and uh, know what they're applying, know what their soils are like, and then there's those that have 
not applied anything like enough lime, not enough fertilizers, and they need to be applying a lot more. And then there's others who've guessed at the other end and they put too much lime on and they put a lot too much nutrient on. I always get a, a, a mixed or match sort of, of people doing lots of different things. It really is quite a good idea to do the sums and, and try not to apply too much or too little. So um, here's just a summary of what we do. Check the soil analysis results, ideally every two to four years, for pH and lime requirement. Is there lime required? Put it on at the right time and uh, at, at the right rate. Crop nitrogen requirements, you need to be looking at those for each crop in each year. Look at the Crofting Horticulture Handbook. Check your soil analysis results for P and K, and only that way will you be able to determine how much P and K to put on. If you're using bagged fertilizers, choose the right product to match the nutrients required. Many people will not know. A very good guide if you're using dungs and composts is you should be putting on somewhere between 10 and 50 tonnes per hectare. That's one, only one to five kilograms per square meter on the ground. That's not very much. A lot of people are putting on too much. Again, see the crofting horticulture handbook. But and the other thing about bulky organic manures, if you're putting on the right amount of P and K, you're almost not you're almost certain not to be putting on enough nitrogen if you're relying solely on dungs um, and compost. Because compost and dungs are great fertilizers for P and K but less good for nitrogen. So in other words, they're not a balanced fertilizer. And bear in mind, crops can only get access to all the nutrients that are present in the soil if soil pH is optimal, about 6.5. Soil structure is good. So there's plenty of air in there and plenty of vertical channels for water and air to move through. You can improve and maintain good soil structure by minimizing cultivations and also not working soils in wet conditions by reducing the amount that animals and people walk on the surface particularly in wet conditions regularly adding organic matter and crop residues to the soil little and often is often best and also resting the soil for a spell in each rotation if you can do that by sowing a grass clover leaf and bear in mind different soil types have different soil properties so sandy soil behaves very differently to a soil which contains a high percentage of clay. And it's important to learn about your own soil types and then learn how to manage them to get the best from them. And there's a fantastic website called the Scottish Soils website. It's run by the James Hutton Institute. Anybody can use that, whether you're a gardener, a small scale grower or an arable farmer with thousands of hectares. It's worth having a look at the, at the Scottish Soils website. OK. Over to you again, Rob. Thank you very much, Audrey. I'll just transfer it over. OK, thanks, Audrey. Uh, that covers the initial the initial stage of developing a poly produce enterprise. Um, so what I'll, I'll be taking you on for about the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, and what I'll be covering is the technology and grant funding that's potentially available uh, for those of you that are, are looking to maybe get started or are maybe actively growing but looking to expand what you're doing. Um, in the Highlands and Islands, we have many factors that limit potential uh, to grow fruit and vegetables effectively. Um, historically, this type of production has been done uh, quite successfully for self-sufficiency. Uh, in a crofting setting in particular, it was really common. However, in recent years, land has been managed more favorably towards livestock production, uh, primarily sheep uh, in most cases. So the limitations to growing uh, now that we're, we're going to look at are environmental and climatic. So soils can be managed as Audrey has, has shown, um, but temperature, wind, daylight hours, um, things like that, these are all factors that influence a crop's ability to grow in a field or a croft. Uh, we challenge these factors through the use of technology. Um, necessity breeds innovation and where something is worth doing, innovations can be found. So to compensate for the limitations that I, I've just noted, uh, technology has been developed over the years that can protect crops against uh, these factors such as temperatures prolong a growing season, uh, protect against wind damage and also allow for produce to be grown in areas that would typically not be suitable uh, due to the climatic conditions. So out in the Hebrides we have high wind speeds, uh, quite high annual rainfall, things like that. So these are factors to mitigate. Um, some versions of these technologies have been used for many years. Uh, many of you all know what a polytunnel is. 
historically greenhouses as well have been uh, proven quite effective. Um, and as a law, as, as time goes on, though, modifications and redesigns, uh, and indeed entirely new designs, uh, come to uh, come to the come to the forefront, uh, which can help um, expand the ability of uh, a local grower, whether it's a crofter, smallholder, uh, no matter where you are in the country, to be able to to diversify and produce more. Um, more for your agricultural business. So knowing the unique characteristics uh, of what's available uh, will allow for a better understanding of what would maybe be most suitable for the area that you're in and what might be most effective for your growing enterprise. Um, obviously the conventional ones that I've just mentioned that we look at are most commonly is the, the polytunnel. Uh, typically of an aluminium frame with polythene sheeting attached. Um, it is quite simple and effective in design. Uh, size variations can be purchased to suit any size of enterprise, uh, whether it's for a garden scale or whether it's for a commercial uh, commercial growing enterprise. Uh, the components are cheap, they're quite easy to replace. Um, greenhouses are more synonymous with garden growers, right enough, uh, and seen in garden centres, sorry, greenhouses, big pardon, are more synonymous with garden growers and seen with uh, gardening centres and botanical areas. They're more expensive than a conventional polytunnel um, and to replace parts uh, are, are significantly more expensive and slightly more fragile, particularly for areas like the Outer Hebrides where we have high wind speeds and such. So speaking of innovations and, in, in, you know, in respect to the, the climate conditions that I've mentioned, we have a, what's a, a step up, which is a more robust Keter house. Uh, the polylaminate cladding is it, it's more, more sustainable than the, the, the poly, uh, polyethylene sheeting that uh, often gets burst through wind. It can uh, quite often, quite often be perforated quite easily whilst being replaced. So there's a longevity with the Keter house as well. Uh, Polycrub, however, that's a, a significantly unique design that's increased in popularity over the last, particularly the last year actually, but they've been on the go for longer than that. Their their design is is based specifically to accommodate. The, the high wind speeds in particular, um, they were developed in Shetland where they can accommodate speeds of up to 130 miles an hour by engineer certification. So there's a variation depending on what, um, what area you're in, what, what your sort of uh, climate conditions are. There's something that fits, fits every enterprise. For a cost comparison, obviously that's the, the main thing when starting to, to undertake and look into technologies and infrastructure, is looking at the cost comparison for how each unit fares up. So the comparative cost of each type of poly unit based on, these are based on the average prices between 2017 and, and 18. Uh, naturally a polytunnel is the cheapest option and possibly offers the widest range of size options. Uh, however, the longevity of the materials, as I've, as I've mentioned, is significantly shorter than that of, such as the Keter House and the Polycrub. Uh, Keter House automatically include installation prices, uh, exclusive of expenses of labor, right enough, uh, but the, they, they, they incorporate the whole, the whole package, and Polycrub have been known to have a very long lifespan. Uh, examples of units on the Isle of Lewis, in particular the Horseshadow Community Cafe, have uh, been productive for about the last decade or so. So depending on which, uh, what, what your enterprise is, which, which sort of avenue you want to go down, if it's, if it's a long-term prospect or if you're looking for something to get you through a couple of seasons, that will factor in what you decide to, to opt for. Uh, what's key with poly units as well is actually the adaptation potential for, um, for whatever type of business that you're running. Green, green agriculture and sustainable agriculture is quite a popular and, and you know, very positive uh, thing that's come to the forefront these days. So with polycrubs, polytunnels, keter houses, greenhouses, there's, there's add-ons that can be factored in. Solar panels that can power batteries for uh, such as temperature controls. Other people have quite successfully uh, installed guttering systems into their greenhouse or their, their polytunnel or polycrub, which captures rainwater. And what this will do is be stored into water butts at the end, as you can see in the picture there. And what that can do is then either be gravity fed uh, into uh, into the inside of the, the, the poly unit, which uh, can be drip fed or you can add nutrients to that. Organic people are uh, manufacturing their own, particularly here actually there's an example where they're making a, a seaweed soup, so to speak, which is a nutrient um, a nutrient based thing that uh, supplies supplies the whatever produce is, is going to be grown inside the unit without really much labor um, labor intervention. So the, obviously with taking on any sort of unit, the, the cost of these units are, are, can be quite high. Uh, 
you know, especially for a small business, particularly in crofting or a small holding, where investing that level of money might be quite a daunting, um, daunting prospect, and has probably put people off over the years uh, before before actually undergoing this sort of enterprise. Uh, this needn't be the case. You know, there are a number of avenues which would be uh, which a grower can look at and help mitigate the costs, um, which we'll go through some of them, uh, some of them just now. The one that we have found to be the most active in the crofting communities and the one that uh, the, the one that crofters I'll, I'll make most use of is the Croft and Agricultural Grant Scheme. Uh, a year ago, we managed to get the first the first polycrub uh, grant application approved, and since then there have been dozens of dozens of applications, and now and dozens of uh, successful units have gone up through grant grant applications such as this. Polytunnels have always been always been eligible under this scheme but it's quite a quite a large amount of money returned for your infrastructure costs to get started um, 60 percent is available to everybody um, but if you're under 41 years of age if you're a new entrant to crofting as well so within the first five years of your crop tenancy you get 80 percent back which completely reduces quite significantly the the initial upfront cost to start in any uh, poly produce business which means you're going to turn uh, turn around a profit faster um, which is which is we think is a, a fantastic thing, quite positive. Um, for, if you're not a crofter, there is an alternative option. Uh, small farms, the false mar, all, okay, pardon, small farms grant scheme. It's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, holding between holdings must be between three and thirty hectares, and the application process itself is very similar to the the Croft and Agricultural Grant Scheme. It's the eligibility criteria that is different. So the first thing is obviously that there's an income test which must be uh, must be assessed to, to see um, the, the the viability of, of whatever business that you're looking to apply for. And there, what's what's known as a single uh, single application form each year must be submitted. This window of opportunity happens. So if you're if you're looking to apply for one in 2019. You must do a, a, an SEF in the year in, in the 2019 year. So the window opens only between the 15th of March and the 15th of May. So if you are considering putting one in 2019 or going down this grant route, if you think you're eligible, it's perhaps uh, ideal to look into doing one of these applications uh, the year of your the year of doing that as well. So if you if you have have any thoughts on that, it's it's worth looking into. Um, beyond individual applications as well, there are uh, there are community funded project uh, projects available as well. Uh, the Climate Challenge Fund is one that allowed polycrubs to become to become relevant in the first place. Uh, the, there's community growing schemes that have used this fund in particular to uh, they, they challenge climate change. So anything that is is green in nature uh, that reduces carbon emissions um, and has a, a community wide um, element to it, this is the, the, this is one of the, the options that we can look into. Um, an additional similar scheme is the leader funding. This fund is available through the, the rural payments department as well, same as the, the crofting agricultural grant and the small farms grant. Um, this is more driven towards areas that, that you don't have to be a community. Individuals can put in uh, applications as well, but it must link into a greater network. So if you have a, an idea, particularly for a poly produce business, let's say, um, it must link in with other elements of perhaps tourism um, or uh, leisure uh, availability, and an example of that here would be we have the um, the Hebridean Way. So things that are food food and drink related that link to accommodations, that link to anything that sort of ties everything, all of that together. These are what are designated as hotspots. And if you are within a hotspot in particular, or you can indeed create a hotspot if you can create more of these these enterprises that link together, that's where you're more likely to. To obtain funding through this grant. Um, in addition to, to funding for actual infrastructure units, sometimes advice can be quite costly as well. Um, but there are funds available to approach a consultant or a, a approach for, for advice and uh, indeed look at the, the viability of what it is that you're looking to do. So under the, the farm advisory service as well, there is a plans for the, 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 the sorry, there is availability for what's known as an integrated land management plan. This is basically an all and comes in quite comprehensive look at what your business is 
uh, looking to do. So we would assess the strengths and weaknesses, um, look at whatever risks are, are present to that and whatever opportunities might be available as well that you might not have thought of or, or, or might not know about that exist. Um, it's particularly ideal for, for diversification. So under the, the Crofting Agri Agricultural Grant, the small farms, all these things, that is the avenue that you would look to go down is diversification. That's what this, this is, particularly in the crofting setup where livestock agriculture has been the, the, the primary mode of agriculture for, for many years. Diversification is, even though you're going back to a practice that was done you know, many, many years ago, decades ago, it's done with, with new technologies and, and contemporary ideas. So diversification is the key that you're, you're, you're looking for. That's the key word. Um, we can also look at uh, things like the financial performance analysis. So where, where a, a business plan might come in, obviously we've talked about the infrastructure costs and quite a daunting prospect to, to undertake that level of expense for something that might not have quite as large returns right away. Uh, or you know, you're, you're waiting for a season or maybe two seasons before you get uh, really into your growing, growing cycle. These are things that we can look at under these schemes. So there's a lot, a lot of availability for funding, and it's not limited to the ones that we've just mentioned there. There are other, um, other potential avenues as well that you can look at. Um, but what we would like to do is, is have you, bring your ideas to, to the Farm Advisory Service, uh, come, come to us, and we can see what we can do for you. Um, which leads us on to the next, the next phase of your, your uh, poly produce journey, which would be what you're going to do with the produce once you have your infrastructure there and you've managed all your soil and uh, you, you know, you're, you're undergrowing with a, a good season ahead of you. So I'll pass you on to, to Callum, who will take you over for the last, uh, last 20 minutes or so. Uh, slides will be available um, after this uh, meeting as well, so you'll have links to, to all the information, the wider information that relates to all the, the grant funding that's available. Uh, over to Callum now. Well, thank you very much, Rob, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'll try and keep my um, bit as short as possible um, so I don't run over. I'm going to talk a wee bit about uh, added value produce and uh, potential routes to market uh, and opportunities for you uh, selling your produce um, to customers. So what is, just to start off, what is added value? Well, added value is the increase in worth or sort of value of a product following enhanced modification. Um, so I've put an image there. You can clearly see it's, it's strawberries that have been uh, converted into uh, strawberry jam. Um, added value can be achieved uh, in many ways. Um, so product modification. Um, enhanced modification. It could be through processing products. So it could be, you know, say um, potatoes into crisps or chips, say. Um, you've also got packaging. So product packaging uh, can actually play a, a, a really important role in adding value to a primary product. And then finally, the service uh, that you offer uh, your customers. So in terms of uh, consumer trends, um, Current consumer trends um, in sort of 2018, 2019, and looking forward, and the main ones are on the screen. So convenience, uh, there's been a huge increase in the convenience market. Um, consumers are becoming more health conscious. Uh, consumers are taking greater interest in uh, the, the traceability of their produce, uh, the provenance of food and drink, um, and also the environmental impacts of, um, of food and drink production. I've put up there that uh, the flexitarian market uh, is one which is growing uh, rapidly. So a flexitarian is, uh, is someone who makes a conscious uh, effort or conscious decision to reduce their um, meat uh, intake. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a vegetarian, it's not a vegan, uh, it's someone who, who makes a conscious decision, whether it's for environmental, uh, for health or for moral, uh, ethical reasons, uh, to reduce their uh, consumption of meat. And then finally, uh, food miles. Um, so shortening the supply chain, um, zero food miles or low food miles is uh, what consumers are, are, are really interested in. And if you can supply a local market, then that is a, that's a real winner for, uh, for customers. Um, and it's all, about, it's all about sort of producing local food, uh, which is available for local people. 
So routes to market, um, well, the first one I've put up is, is farmers markets. Um, farmers markets have grown uh, over the past 20, 25 years. There's now over 500 uh, certified farmers markets in the UK and over 70 in Scotland. Farmers markets are uh, a really good uh, way of selling fresh produce directly to consumers on the high street. Um, it offers, it allows food and drink producers um, to, to showcase their produce and also engage uh, with your customers. Now, on the flip side to that, uh, as a consumer, as a customer, um, you, you've got the opportunity to, to engage with producers, get a greater understanding of where your produce comes from, uh, how it was grown. If you're if you're doing livestock, you're rearing livestock. Customers can find out about the the animal welfare, um, and you know, and and what you're doing uh, back at home. And in terms of poly crubs or poly produce, um, it could be a real way to to develop your unique selling point. So. I'm, I'm aware that you know the audience tonight is is from a large ge geographical uh, area. Um, some some of you will have local farmers markets. Some some of you might not. But if you're going to a farmers market and you've got say 15 or 20 other producers, you could um, you could effectively add value to your produce because it's grown in a polycrop, and that could be your uh, unique selling point. Now, if you're not sure about your local um, farmer's market, um, have a look at the Pharma website. It's the Farm Association Retail Markets Association. Uh, if you have a look there, there is a map um, which illustrates where the, the, the local farmer's markets are in Scotland. Another method um, to, to, to supply fresh produce to, to consumers is through box schemes. And as it says really on the tin, uh, a box scheme is where producers deliver their produce directly to uh, customers. Box produce can increase, uh, can significantly increase profitability uh, and output to small to medium sized food and drink businesses. Box schemes allow consumers uh, the opportunity to buy fresh local produce, uh, which is di delivered directly to their door. And uh, Roots and Fruits, you'll see on the screen there, um, that's a company um, based in Edinburgh. Um, and, and have a look, Google them, have a look them up. They do weekly veg boxes. Um, customers can either collect from their central distribution point or um, they can be delivered um, to their door. So they, they sell fresh potatoes, carrots, onions, um, strawberries, other fruits um, and eggs. Um, and as a rough um, sort of cost, um, they're selling an organic box of fresh produce um, for two people at 30 pound. Now, that is a huge uh, markup on um, fresh uh, fruit and veg. Roots and Fruits uh, are, also, are also based in Glasgow um, and uh, they, they sell to, to local customers. And that's something that could be done uh, whether you're you know you're in a city or indeed if you're in uh, you know on an island in the countryside is uh, supplying fresh produce to to local people. Processing product. Um, this is a method of adding value um, through through modification. So it could be. Um, making soups, it could be jams, preserves. Um, processing product is beneficial because it increases the shelf life of finished product. And it's a really good method of reducing food waste. So you'll have heard on the on the media, on the news, etc., cetera, um, things about wonky veg and the wonky veg market. Um, supermarkets are, uh, are jumping on this bandwagon. Um, but wonky veg, this, this is a really good way. It utilizes all of your fruit, uh, veg products. So if you're producing for, uh, let's say, a, a bigger uh, market or a larger customer, and you, say, can't market all of your produce, and um, processing product could be a way of uh, making sure that you can sell all of your your finished uh, produce. Uh, moving on to to a, a new initiative, um, farm vending. Uh, farm vending is something which 
really evolved probably in only really in Scotland in the past three to four years. Um, it started off um, in Europe and slowly the ideas come across here. And it's a really good method um, for farmers and um, rural businesses and food producers to sell fresh produce uh, directly to consumers. Now, traditionally, Farmers uh, would sell produce via an honesty box um, at the end of the farm road. But unfortunately, the, the so-called honesty, honesty system wasn't very honest and customers were, were um, taking uh, fresh produce and not uh, paying for it. So a method of combating this was to put in a vending machine um, to ensure that customers uh, have to pay for their, their produce. So farm vending is it's novel. It's a relatively cheap uh, method of diversification. It allows customers to purchase uh, fresh produce directly from the farm, or it can be from a central location. Now, I I work uh, on the mainland. I work uh, between Perth, uh, sometimes in Perth, sometimes in Aberdeen, and. I've seen farm vending machines in shopping centres. I've seen farm vending machines at railway stations, places where there are a high number of people passing um, who want to purchase fresh local produce and it's really convenient. So what they can do is they put in their £1.50 for their eggs or however much it's selling for and open, open the window. There it is and away they go. Really convenient. It's traceable. There's low food miles and it's convenient for customers. In terms of the costs, um, a 28 compartment ambient machine, uh, you'd be looking at around eight to nine thousand pounds. Um, the machines do come refrigerated. Um, so if you were, say, doing meat products or you were doing dairy products uh, that need to be kept refrigerated, these machines are coming in around about 12 to 13,000 pounds. There's a company called JSR Vending. Uh, they are based in Blair Gowrie and it's, a, it's run by a guy called Stuart Retson. And he is the, 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 the first and sole distributor of vending machines in Scotland. Now, that cost there might uh, be quite uh, startling. You might be thinking, why would I want to spend nine grand on a vending machine? Well, it's really, it's really useful. It's really good, a good way to add value to your produce. And I've spoken to a number of uh, existing um, businesses who have got vending machines. All of them have said that it's paid off within a year. Now, it could be that if you don't want to, to invest uh, £9,000 or, or, or more, you could collaborate. So you could work with other suppliers. Uh, this would help reduce costs, but it would also allow you to keep the machine regularly topped up. Vending machines, uh, they're novel, fun and interesting for consumers. It's a method of adding value. Again, it comes back to what I said earlier, local food, uh, making local food available for local people, and it allows you to target a varied market. However, you must consider uh, the location, so it needs to be easily accessible for customers and it needs to be regularly stocked. And again, I've put down there a producer cooperative because I think there's a real opportunity, particularly in the Highlands and Islands, for producers to work together um, to supply um, fresh uh, produce. In terms of legislation, um, if you are planning to, to go into, say, processing your products, producing jams, soups, etc., you must notify the local authority at least 28 days before your business starts. You are legally required to have formal food safety and hygiene certification. Again, um, speak to your local authority and your business will, will undergo regular food hygiene inspections. It's also critical that you follow the principles of HACCP, uh, Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Point, during um, the process. In terms of packaging, um, I'll, I'll cover this very briefly. Um, it's fairly self-explanatory. So outer packaging, if you're packaging a product, it must be robust, uh, robust and fit for purpose. It must protect the product from damage, temperature, vibration, and any environmental um, conditions. And it must um, display product information. So if you're, say, producing soup, uh, you must have the cooking instructions, cooking recommendations, any allergen information, and also put on the labeling uh, storage requirements, whether it's to be stored in the fridge, 
uh, or, or other. And it's also, um, it's also critical to put use by and best before dates on product packaging. A growing uh, trend in the market in the food and drink uh, sector is uh, sustainable packaging. Consumers are becoming more environmentally uh, conscious and there's a shift to reduce plastic and polystyrene. Uh, so something to consider is the recyclability and reusability potential of your product packaging. And businesses, companies that I've worked with, um, I often go with the approach that less is more. Um, one thing that I find really frustrating is when you, or, you order something from Amazon and you've got to you've got to get your way through three layers of packaging uh, before you can get to the product. Um, so I often advise uh, even food businesses is, is less is more. Minimalistic packaging is often well received by customers. In terms of the packaging, you can keep it natural. Um, you know, countryside images, uh, photography, etc. Um, An association with the farm or croft is often well received. I've put up some examples. Um, an excellent example uh, I would recommend is a company called Woolcool. Woolcool um, produce 100% uh, recyclable um, sheep wool insulating packaging. What they do is they take out grade wool um, from the British Wool Board and they create this um, these boxes, pouches, which are fully insulated and can store uh, chilled products for up to 24 hours. And it's a really good, it's really quite attractive and it's a great uh, selling point. There's a company called Kuhn Tech, uh, a Scottish based biotech company. They're making compostable antimicrobial bioplastic from fish waste. So they, they extract chitin, which is uh, a naturally occurring biopolymer, from uh, shellfish and longestines. And if you if you Google Kuhn Tech, you can see a video of the, the process. It's done in a lab. And effectively, what they're producing is a, a, an antimicrobial compostable cling film. And it's really quite cool. Um, and it's again, it's got a great selling point. The Happy Egg Company, um, they, uh, as you can see in the images there, they make um, they make egg boxes from hay. And um, I don't know what that will do to the price of hay, but uh, it's aesthetically pleasing. It's uh, visual, natural, and it also uh, relates to a chicken nest. So as a customer. Um, if you're buying it, then you've got this association with the farm and it's a great uh, selling point. The only downside is I wouldn't like to see the mess in the kitchen uh, after you've used it uh, 10 times. Moving on to, to product distribution. Um, so you've, you, you've got your produce. Uh, so how do I get it out to customers? Well, you can either do it by your own vehicle or you could subcontract it to somebody else. Now, there are a number of benefits and limitations um, to this. So the benefits of your own vehicle, you've got complete control uh, of the process. You can ensure that uh, produce are delivered on time and you can also speak to your customers and gain customer feedback. The only downside is it is time consuming. You've got the costs involved with vehicle maintenance. You've got mileage, you've got depreciation, you've got MOTs, servicing, tire wear, etc. And also if you're doing it yourself, you've got a limited geographical audience. You could subcontract it to a courier service. Um, it's beneficial because it allows you to spend more time on the core business activities. You don't have direct vehicle costs and you don't need to pay someone to drive the vehicle. There is, uh, and if you were to subcontract it, there is less control over the de delivery service. Um, charges um, in, incurred will reduce your profit margin, but it does allow you to um, transport products to a wider geographical area. A really good example um, uh, that I've come across lately is Sky and Lochalsh Food Link Van. Um, this is an initiative on the Isle of Skye for transporting fresh local produce around the island to, um, to restaurants, to hotels um, all over the island. And what it is, is basically, it's a method of distribution. It's run by a company, Sky and Locale CIC. If you Google them, uh, this will give you, it'll give you more information. They distribute herbs, 
uh, vegetables, um, fish, shellfish and meat. They, they pick up the meat uh, and produce from the croft and they transport it um, to, to Michelin star restaurants, hotels, bed and breakfasts and uh, cafes uh, all over the island. Um, the, the, the producers will pay, they have to pay a 10% levy on the value of produce carried. And I've just put there the, the growth. Um, so the Food Link van started in March 2000. And it was it was carrying in per annum. It was carrying about six, just over six and a half thousand pounds worth of produce around the island. And in July last year, they've grown significantly, and they were carrying just over ninety thousand pounds worth of local produce around the island. And this is something that could be rep replicated um, on the Outer Hebrides on on other islands. Um, and if this is something of interest uh, to anyone uh, listening this evening. I have recently spoken to the guy who runs the van and I would be able to put you in touch um, to find out more uh, if that's of interest. In terms of funding, uh, Rob spoke a wee bit about uh, funding for the, for the poly crubs. Um, there's, an, there's another initiative uh, called uh, the Regional Food Fund. It's Scottish government funding through Connect Local. And it's an initiative to support um, projects in Scotland promoting locally sourced and produced food and drink. There's a grant available. It's a £5,000 grant to support business development. But the key thing with this fund is they have to be collaborative projects. Now, that's where I made emphasis earlier on to things like farm vending is to work collaboratively. Now, if there were a group of producers um, looking to put in a vending machine, uh, say there were five producers, then the five producers could apply for regional food funding and get £5,000, which would go a long way to supporting the cost of a vending machine. So I've just put there, uh, projects should be collaborative and promote Scottish food and drink at local, regional and national level. So this can be of any scale. This can be as, as small as you like or, or as big as you like. And I've also put a link uh, to the website there. And that is the, the end of my, uh, my stint. Um, thank you for listening and I'll, I'll hand back to Rob. Many thanks, Callum. Thank you very much. So that that concludes uh, that concludes the presentations for this evening. Um, I hope that the presentations tonight have provided a basis of thought for many of you looking to begin a, a poly produce enterprise, or even if it's just given ideas to some of the elements that you might want to consider uh, if you're already an active active grower. Um, if you wish to find out more about any of the topics discussed, uh, you can contact the Farm Advisory Serv Service helpline for some initial advice on 0300 323 0161 or via the email address at advice at faz.scot. Um, you'll find these on the Farm Advisory Service website, many of you which uh, use that to log in tonight. Um, queries will be directed to a consultant in your local area and they'll be able to get, get you started. Uh, that now concludes tonight's webinar. Thank you all for taking the time to log on. Uh, and, and such a huge turnout, which we are very, very happy with. Uh, and from myself and the speakers tonight, we wish you the very best in your current or future poly produce enterprise. Thank you.